how do I actually become a data scientist, energy data scientist? Where should I start? What should I think about doing? How did you get here? And so what we thought we'd do is spend the hour really just diving in and answering that questions with Dr. Foster and Dr. Perch. And so if you are unfamiliar um, with, with our two co-founders, I'll give a high level background and then um, I'll let them kind of describe their backgrounds themselves. But both Dr. Foster and Dr. Perch are associate professors at uh, the University of Texas at Austin, um, Hildebrand Department of Petroleum Engineering and Geosystems Engineering and the Jackson School of Geology. Dr. Perch is a longtime industry practitioner. He is literally the geostats guy and is our professor who specializes in all things geology, machine learning, and reservoir characterization. Dr. Foster, on the other hand, is a little different. Um, he is our internal expert on all things software engineering, geomechanics, aerospace engineering, and computational modeling. And so over the last few weeks, um, we asked you over social media for questions that you were interested in hearing about. So thank you for all of those who have posted questions. Our plan is to start with those. And then as we have, if we have time at the end, um, have you all live message questions to us in the chat window. And so with that short introduction, I think the best place and the best thing to do is just to get started. So John, first questions for you. Like I, I mentioned to the group that um, your background was aerospace engineering. So what is your origin story? How did you end up at the intersection of energy and data science? Yeah, so I mean, technically, my my PhD is in is in aerospace engineering from Purdue. However, I, I kind of consider myself a mechanical engineer. That's where my my undergraduate and master's degrees were. Um, I, I I went to uh, after my master's degree, I went to work at Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and ended up back at Purdue because I had a, a relationship with an advisor there and and uh, was working on a similar topic. And so I kind of went went there and ended up in aerospace engineering more for the advisor than necessarily the, the degree program. Uh, but upon, you know, returning to Sandy, I ended up working there seven years. And for the most part of that time, I was a, a code developer developing physics codes, primarily fi finite element codes that would run on the world's largest computers. So massive, massively parallel supercomputers that the DOE has uh, uh, kind of historically been known for. And so in, in, you know, I kind of consider myself a computational mechanician and, and part of that in, in learning uh, of course, the programming aspects and software engineering, but also uh, a lot of approximation theory for uh, approximating, uh, you know, function spaces for finite elements and other things. And, and, and so, uh, and then of course, big large scale nonlinear solvers for, for solving, you know, actually solving these codes, the, you know, calculating the solution to these PDEs. So when I later got kind of interested in data science, what I quickly realized was that in terms of the mathematics, I already really knew everything. I, I just needed to learn the lingo. So you know, for example, you know, Dr. Perch comes from a background of geostats and a popular approximation theory uh, in geostats is something called Krieging. Well, what he would call Krieging, I would call radial basis function approximation with a Gaussian kernel, right? Coming from, coming from a mathematics or or uh, uh, approximation theory background, but but structurally, mathematically, they're identical. If they do the same thing, right? So it's just the lingo and 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 speaking. And that's what I found uh, as I kind of transitioned from you know physics-driven computational mechanics into machine learning. Uh, you know, a lot of the solvers, optimizers, all of that. It's it's very similar stuff. It's just a matter of learning the lingo so that you can speak well, so that you can read the papers in that field and then you know speak speak to the to the to the audience that's interested in that so I, I kind of feel like that that most engineers you know from any background discipline engineering who can code well can quickly transition into a, a data science role um, and, and a certain and that's absolutely true if they have an advanced degree and have done any type of you know computational modeling they they, they certainly have the mathematical background needed to to translate so I think I'll end there give Dr. Perch a chance. Perfect, yeah. Dr. Perch, I'd love to hear uh, the Canadian origin story for you. So I have to apologize. I'm not wearing a green shirt today. I didn't get the memo, so I'm <laughs> sorry about that, John and Canal. But um, I think I'm personally evidence that people with engineering and geoscience degrees can transition, and I won't even say transition, can naturally grow into the area of data science. We are from an industry that's used to working with big data. 
We uh, deal with very difficult estimation problems. We deal with statistical analysis and uncertainty, multi-scales and so forth. So my origin story, I started out as a mining engineer in undergrad, and then I turned to the dark side of geostatistics, or is that the light side? I'm not sure which side of the force that is. But geostatistics in my uh, graduate studies, finished with a PhD in geostats, and then went off to industry. I want to get some industry experience. I want to see real problems, work with real data. And the problem with that was I had too much fun. I enjoyed industry so much that I stayed for 13 years, wrote a book while I was there, and then ended up back here in academia to try to teach, give back, and share some of the things I learned. But overall, I did find, as Dr. Foster said, that having fundamental engineering, knowledge about the domain made me well prepared to be able to work in the area of data analytics, machine learning, and so forth. It's amazing. Our geostatistical models, our statistical models, well, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and we can extend them to other types of machine learning. And often what's interesting is the machine learning methods can actually look very much like the methods by which we map in the subsurface. Um, if we're working with K nearest neighbors, it, it looks very much like the methods that we use for the purpose of trend modeling. So that's how I, that's how I ended up here. That's, that's fantastic. Um, John, just to riff on something you said, um, so you kind of came to the industry as an outsider, right? And so over the last, call it five to 10 years, we've seen a lot of, um, call it, folks not from the oil and gas industry try to apply data science and, um, you know, to energy and subsurface machine learning, work, or subsurface workflows. Um, what, how did you get up this, how did you get up the learning curve so fast on like actually just the principles of the subsurface? Is, was it, was just understanding the engineering enough and sufficient? Because I mean, I'm sure your, your dissertation yeah. and your PhD were totally different. So sure, there, there, there's, there's part of the story I, I didn't tell in that a lot of what I did at Sandia and writing those finite element codes was to actually develop uh, and implement some of the most sophisticated geomaterial constitutive models that are, exist. Um, and, and so I learned a tremendous amount of how geomaterials deform under, you know, high strain rates, uh, you know, high pressures, uh, and, and both did a lot of experimental work and learned a lot about the experimental work and that, that you know, and, and geomaterials are much more complex than, say, metals or you know, things that mechanical engineers are used to using. They're, they're far more complex and, and uh, you know, they can have all kind of interesting inelastic behavior, you know, deep in the subsurface. And uh, of course, uh, so I was working with and, and, and populating those material models and, and working on verifying, validating in these large scale codes. And, and I learned a tremendous amount of geomechanics. And then also my, my PhD was, was related to fracture mechanics or computational modeling of fracture. And so I just, when I got to academia, I decided to put those two things together and started to build models that could uh, you know, develop uh, models for hydraulic fracture simulations. So it was actually my research that kind of led me into petroleum engineering. But uh, once I got there, uh, I was kind of so fascinated by all the interesting problems. And and again, if you can if you can solve you know PDEs on a computer, then all of engineering is just four four equations, right? Conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And the the only thing that's left is constitutive models, right? So you know, for example, coming into petroleum engineering. The, the most fundamental equation for single phase flow um, in, a, in a reservoir, you know, is, is, is identical to the, you know, mathematically identical to the equations we use for heat transfer from mechanical engineering. So just, you know, it, it was actually quite easy. It, it, again, somewhat just learning the lingo, you know, learning to translate exactly, you know, how the physical parameters of these math, mathematical equations you know, uh, manifest as a physical process. Uh, understanding that uh, was was really the only trick to to moving into it. Yeah, that's fascinating. That that's super cool. Okay, Michael, I have a uh, I have a softball question for you, and it might be you know like asking a barber if if you need a haircut. But um, hey, it, it is you, you'll see you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, so, <laughs> In the industry um, over the last call it few years, AI and machine learning have been pop topical kind of buzzwords. Um, 
and I know you teach our subsurface machine learning class, but at a high level, do you think that AI and machine learning in our industry is a must have or a nice to have? Yeah, and Kunal, that's a really good question. We used to say those with the best data win. And what I've realized over the last few years, it's those who have the best data and do the best with their data. They're the ones who win. It's getting to a point where the capability to explore data, find anomalies, uh, reduce the dimensionality, uh, find out what features really matter, and then build complicated models that can actually tell you something about the natural setting. It's getting to the point where that's so good through machine learning. It'd be really hard to be able to say that you're doing the best with your data if you weren't using those tools. I, I, I think we've reached that point. Now, let me put a caveat on that. And that is, I'm an advocate for low complexity modeling. And I mean that as far as machine learning models that have low complexity, high interpretability. And so I do think that we need to be very mindful not to just jump to complexity. The, the variance bias trade-off in machine learning teaches that to us anyway. And we'll discover it when we do model tuning and we truly test our models. But no, uh, Kanal, I really do think we're reaching a point where we really need to use these tools. It's like going back a couple decades ago and trying to do reservoir characterization forecasting and not using geostatistics. And there were companies that said, well, we'll just do basic interpolation. We're not going to account for uncertainties. I think it would be a disadvantage not to use the new technologies. Fair enough. No, that, that's, a, that's a great response. Um, so then I'll, I'll add a, a second part of that question. So what has been the coolest application of machine learning that you've seen in the past year? All right. So last 12 months since COVID started, what's been the coolest thing you've seen? Okay, that's a tough question, Kadal. Can I give uh, Can I give a couple? I, yeah, I, I, want, I want my turn too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You're getting you guys. <laughs> so um, I would I would say that some of the new tools to detect anomalies and significant differences in data I think are very powerful, very useful. That's first order. Knowing uh, kind of being able to explore and see things in our data. Uh, I have a PhD student, Wendy Liu, who did some really cool stuff, just came out in a journal on mathematical geosciences. And another student, uh, Julian Salazar, has done some work in the area of telling the significance, seeing the significance of changes in our geologic data sets in space, accounting for all of our models. I think that's very powerful. But let's jump to deep learning. And um, what I would say, I'm really excited by some of the stuff coming out of GANs. Uh, specifically getting into methods where we do super resolution, being able to downscale seismic information condition to seismic and wells. I'm seeing reservoir models now with good uncertainty models, ensembles of models that are far in advance of anything I've seen with the best geostatistical methods. And so I, I, I think we're on the cusp of a serious step change in the way we model our reservoirs. I'm excited about that. That's fantastic. John, same question, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, so what has been the coolest application of machine learning that you've seen in the last 12 months? And I'm yeah. curious to see the physics-based angle, if you have one, like merging the two together. Okay, well, you have to give me, give me three, uh, three responses. There. All right, you get three Let's responses. So the, the, um, the first thing I was going to mention, I mean, was announced, one of the coolest things in the world of machine learning was just announced last week. I mean... Uh, Facebook's got a new image recognition model that doesn't require labeled data that can outperform ResNet 50 and some of the other ones that have massive labeled data sets, you know, so I think this is really, really impressive. And, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how we can apply some of those technologies in, in oil and gas. Uh, so then the, part of the reason I wanted to answer this question too was to give a little, I guess, humble brag to our department or to Dr. Perch. I, I actually was lucky enough to sit on a, a PhD committee just last week for a student that he advised with another professor in the department that had developed a fully autonomous, um, basically mud rheology and cuttings uh, transport analyzer um, that, you know, will basically, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's gonna replace mud, mud engineers <laughs> at some point in the future. But more importantly than that, it, it, it's going to, um, it's going to help automate drilling through managed pressure drilling and other things and make the whole process safer, get more people off the rig, uh, make the, make the process safer. And, 
and I just thought it was a really, really nice job. It was kind of a, a, a really sweet application that it, uh, involved data analytics, some machine learning. And by the way, the machine learning, it, it, uh, as Michael mentioned, it wasn't it, it tremendously complex. You know, these weren't deep neural networks, really. It was just, you know, decision tree type models and other things that performed the best. But what the student did a great job was cross validation and ensuring that everything was, um, you know, was truly, uh, not you know robust to overfitting and other things like that. So I think that was a pretty cool uh, thing that that you know will have some ap applicability. There's already a company been formed, and I think you're going to start to see these fully automated you know mud rheology systems in play uh, use you know in the field. So so that was that. And then um, you know in the last year or so, two years, there's been a lot of work in so-called scientific machine learning, um, which I've talked about and. In, in, various platforms over the last few weeks, seminars and other things. But um, I think I think some of the stuff that's the MIT Julia guys have done, um, they, you know, what I mean is the, the Julia programming language and the, and the guys at the Julia lab at MIT have, done, have shown some really nice examples of scientific machine learning by say embedding neural networks inside the solution of differential equations to, to basically, you know, act as surrogate constituent models and showing that you can learn those models accurately with small data. You can actually interpret some of those models. Uh, some, of, some of their models even spit out mathematical equations. So they do like a symbolic regression against, uh, against you know, polynomials essentially, and then spit out mathematics you know, uh, uh, as the answer. And I think that's, that's pretty neat because it, you get to learn about the physics through the machine learning. And uh, you know, one, any, I think, most people would agree that one physical model beats a thousand machine learning models, if it's accurate, of course. It's accurate, yeah. yeah. Wait, can you actually, quick definition question, what is the difference between the scientific machine learning that you're talking about versus the machine learning that everyone else generally talks about? How yeah, so they... it's kind of, kind of a, a new, new phrase that's been coined, but, and, and there's various ways to talk about it, and all of them are, are sort of equally valid definitions or fall, fall in the umbrella of scientific machine learning. But basically it's, it's just something that sits at the intersection of forward physics-based simulation and, and statistical inference or machine learning. So one, one idea, something that's been done for a long time is that you can use physics-based models, say finite element models to generate you know, lots of synthetic data that then you could use that synthetic data to train a machine learning model to act as a surrogate that would run much faster than you know, running 10,000 realizations of finite element codes. So th that's one, but kind of the least interesting. Uh, the more interesting are these ones where you're, you're say embedding machine learning models inside the solution of physical differential equations, balance laws and other things like that. Um, I, I think that's, that, that's another thing. And uh, uh, the last one would be these so-called physics informed neural networks where in your objective function, uh, in addition to just say, the typical mean squared error like type loss function where you're just trying to minimize the, the difference in the data and, and the prediction. In addition to that, you have some regularization term that it's usually something to do with the physics. So for example, it could be a balance law. It could be a constraint. In, in our world, you know, a simple constraint like permeability must be a positive number can make a big difference. Uh, one of my favorite kind of anecdotal examples I show is just I feed some porosity permeability information to and train a scikit-learn model with it. And it'll happily just predict negative permeabilities all day long. But if you if you just do some sim, you know add some simple constraints, then you can get a really good model to predict permeability from porosity. That's much better than the typical Cosini Karman models. Um, but but you do have to constrain you know put in some constraints. So something as simple as just permeability must be positive uh, makes a big difference. Sure. No, that's so. Thank you. That that's that's a very helpful context. Um, so. Michael, um, curious. So in all of your classes, you tell everyone that you started with what Fortran, moved to C++, and then are now all Python all the time. So I'm curious for you in terms of data science, just holistically speaking, what is what are the most important programming languages right now? And do you foresee them changing in the next, say, five years, 10 years? Um, just given how much uh, change has happened in the last five. Well, Kunal, you, you put me in a tough spot with that question. Um, I do think it's important to be multilingual. 
when it comes to programming languages. I recognize the fact that they all have their kind of advantages and disadvantages. And um, kind of a dark secret about me, I still pick up and use Fortran pretty regularly. There's so much good code and for Fortran libraries and so forth available. And when I just want to get something numerically done, sometimes I'll use it. C++ too. Uh, what I find with Python is when it comes to rapid prototyping, leveraging the world's brilliance, using packages, I find that I do much less coding in Python, but I get more done. And, and so I think you'll find that probably 90% right now I'm, I'm using Python. Now, I, I have to admit, I'm not as good at this as Dr. Foster is. He has much more expertise in the software side, right? So I kind of go with the flow. I did try to pick up a couple of years ago, Julia, and I found that it was still a little bit, you know, maybe three, four years ago, it seemed a little immature. The docs weren't there. There was some reliability issues. I may look at it again. So I, you know, in general, I kind of go with the flow of what's kind of getting the job done. Well, I want to riff on something you said. You said it's important to be multilingual. Why, why do you, could you explain your kind of rationale behind like why it's important to be multilingual versus a, you know, one-stop shop in terms of languages? So when it comes to coding, I'm really focused on prototyping and building uh, workflows. And so I'm very open-minded when it comes to encouraging coding with my students or anyone I work with. If, they're, if, if they need JavaScript to put workflows together in some large CAN software package, then be good at JavaScript. Learn how to do that and be able to build your workflows. My, I'm, I'm an advocate for being able to use and extend, mm -hmm. you know, we, you have creativity through putting your own workflows together. So whatever platform you work in, learn how to be able to automate and do that. Sure, no, that, that, that's very helpful. John, same question for you. Um, what do you think the most important programming, programming languages are for data science today? And where do you see that going in say the next yeah. five years? So uh, uh, I also started with Fortran. I learned Fortran uh, as a first language and when I was uh, still an undergraduate. And when I got to Sandia, we, we wrote, we continued to write some codes in Fortran. Uh, most of the professional development I did at Sandia was in C++. Um, today, 90% of what I do is in Python. Um, you know, I, I love Michael's quote about it. You know, I, 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 I write less code, but I get more, more done. Is that, is that what you say? Is that, is that the quote? Um, you know, I, I think most of the time I can write Python code that's not, you know, by using libraries, of course, uh, from the py the scientific Python stack like like NumPy and SciPy, uh, and and more recently Jax and other things, uh, Numba. So I mean, using those tools, I can write Python code that's probably ninety percent as fast as the C plus plus code I would have written. But I can write that code in ten percent of the time it would have taken me to write and debug the C plus mm plus -hmm. code. You know, and so you know you have to you have to really be worried about uh, you know, every edge case of performance for that kind of trade-off and development time to really matter. So I, I think today it's just not even debatable that Python is the language of machine learning followed closely by, by R. Um, but but I, I really uh, am in love with Julia right now, even though I don't you know, spend too much time working with it. Uh, most of my new projects I'm starting, I'm starting in Julia. Um, I think the type system is, is really clever uh and i just think it's too good of a language to ignore i, I will agree to some extent with uh, dr perch certainly a few years ago the the docs the libraries were far behind python uh but but i think that's that's catching up and 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 one of the the beauty the beauty of it is because of the type system it's what it's become is like a a, a language-wide differential programming language so in other words you know in machine learning we need to compute gradients of functions, right? And sometimes those functions could be 10,000 lines of code or very complicated, right? And we, we often have to compute gradients through those functions and we do that via automatic differentiation. I mean, that's that's really what the, the underlying tool set of the popular like TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, that's what they have going for them. Um, and, uh, you know, in, when, in the Python world, you have a lot of historical glue code, right? So underlying a lot of the SciPy algorithms are old Fortran libraries. 
And so you can't just feed in an automatic differentiation type to like write through those Fortran libraries to try to compute gradients. It's never, it doesn't work, it's gonna fail. But the design of Julia is such that most of the libraries, like for example, dataframes.jl or differentialequations.jl, which, you know, differentialequations.jl is a pure Julia implementation that covers a lot of the stiffness switching algorithms and stuff that you would find in the classic Fortran differential equation solvers. But on top of that, the full language or the full library is automatically differentiable. So if you embed a neural network inside of that guy and then need to train to learn the parameters of the network through the solution of the differential equation, it's, it's, it's fully doable without any changes to the code in Julia. And, and quite frankly, that, that is code wide. Almost any library that you're using in Julia has that property, that generic or differential programming, which is why I see it, you know, uh, really maybe in another five years, it, it, we could be using it like we're using Python now. Um, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. No, that that that's very helpful. And I'll be I'll be honest, and you already know this. I don't know much about Julia. So, um, was it hard for you? I mean, you're you're a savant at picking up programming languages. Was it hard for you to pick up the language? And kind of the second part to that question was, um, how do you choose when to use Python or Julia? If they have you know a lot of overlap and a lot of say your templates and stuff you've built in the past are in Python, how do you, you know, choose between yeah. Python and Julia and building in Julia something new? Yeah, and that reason that you mentioned right there, a lot of your templates or code or libraries or stuff you've already written is already in Python. That's the reason I still do 90% of my programming in Python because I'm, I'm reusing old code or, or extending code that, you know, I'm not gonna rewrite the whole project. You know, it's, it's, it's not worth it in many cases. But like I said before, I think most new projects I'm starting from scratch. Uh, I start I start with Julia. Um, it, it, that's a very complicated question. I could probably spend the rest of the time talking yeah. about, you know, like what 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 the you know how are you going to productionize it? What's the what's the end goal? Is this just um, uh, just something a learning experience for you? Um, you know those kinds of things. I, I think one of the reasons I'm still a huge advocate of Python as a first language is just because the user base is so large. There's so much help out there on Stack Overflow and other things. So you know, if you don't know any coding at all, you should absolutely start with Python. Um, you know, to, to, to move to Julia was actually quite, it was simple. I mean, the syntax is essentially a kind of a blend of Python and, and MATLAB syntax, two languages already knew. And I think this is probably true of even foreign languages. Like the more you know, the, the easier it is to pick mm -hmm. up new ones. And it's because a lot of, the, certainly the newer languages, they're just borrowing what they like from the older languages and, and then changing things they don't like. Uh, and so the more languages you know, uh, then the easier it is to pick up new ones because it's just, uh, you know, it's just a matter of kind of figuring out the syntax and the more experience you have, sometimes you can even guess at it, you know? <laughs> sure. No, that's, uh, that's helpful. And so I guess there is no like simple heuristic for choosing X language or Y language. It's, it's just a lot of expertise and knowing what you're trying to go for, yep. if, if I'm characterizing that correctly. Cool. Okay, well, why don't we um, why don't we why don't we go higher level a little bit, uh, Michael? I have a question for you, and actually, is is really one of the main topics for this panel, um, which is, what courses would you recommend to get started and move towards actually becoming an energy data scientist? And I'll put it in the frame of, say, I am in a subject matter expert in petroleum engineering or geology, or I'm an industry expert. How do I move towards becoming an energy data scientist? Where would you start? Well, you can start with the definition of data scientist and everybody draws that Venn diagram with uh, domain expertise, statistics and coding, and then the overlap, the intersection of all three of those domains. That, that's what we're trying to do. And so if you look at that, I, I do believe in building from fundamentals. The statistics is, is it's essential, understanding probability theory, understanding uh, inference, deduction, understanding how we can characterize and work with uncertainty and so forth. I, I think it's really important to start there from the statistics. And, you know, we build on our domain expertise and Kanal, thank you very much for stating that because we do, I do think that's the most critical to being a good energy data scientist is to have a great foundation in the domain expertise in geosciences or engineering. But we build on that with a foundation or kind of very strong footing in statistics and then when it comes to coding, 
And I kind of, I may sound like this already, but, you know, kind of learn enough that you can get the job done. And I, I'm going to steal something from Dr. Foster. I think you've said this before. Every time you turn to do something in Excel, just stop yourself and do it in Python. And you're going to learn something new. It may take three times as long to do it. I think that's the way we can kind of transition and kind of gain those skills. Coding is doing. You have to, you have to do it. Okay, so let me go back to your original question. There are, there's a lot of content that's available. Of course, Datum does teach professionals, you know, the basics of machine learning and data science. I think that's a great option. There's a lot of great sources online. But I think building on it, focused on the statistics and then moving into the machine learning theory and then practice. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, I don't disagree with anything Michael said. Um, of course, I'd uh, love to have, have you in any of our classes. And I think it's a great, great jumping off point for most people. Um, if if you, you can't attend our classes for whatever reason, uh, a great kind of free references out there, in particular if you're interested in learning these skills from a Python perspective, is a book by a guy named Jake Vanderplas who works at Google uh, called the Python Data Science Handbook. It's a free book uh, that you can get on GitHub and uh, or it's hosted on GitHub, so it's free there. With, along with all the Jupyter notebooks, you can run the code and whatever. Um, and I agree, you know, I think get in there and, and code, you know, do, try things out open up scikit-learn. I mean, one of the beautiful uh, things about scikit-learn is the consistent API amongst all the different estimators. So you can get in there and you can start to build uh, models or use models as black boxes, even though you have no idea what the, you know, what, what the underlying, uh, you know, algorithms are. And I don't think that's necessarily a good idea to do for, for very long. However, it's, it's a good way to get started because you can see results right away. And then, you know, as you, as you get more interest in that, and, and in Jake's book, he covers, you know, some of the basics of the most basic machine learning algorithms, like, you know, regression and naive Bayes, other things like that. But I think then moving on, uh, Michael's favorite reference is the James et al. Um, introduction to statistical learning. Uh, uh, also a, a great, easy to, easy to read book uh, that they will get, act as a jumping off point into the theory of the, of the methods. And, and Michael, just to riff on something both of you guys said, um, you said statistics is really important to learn, even before the coding. And I know, I feel like a lot of people will jump towards a course where it's, you know, data science in Python and start there and really think about the tactics of implementing code to solve their problem. Could you, could you riff on why statistics is so important in the context of data science, like how it fits in and why, you know, you can't do data science without having a very firm grasp of statistics or just your thoughts on it overall. So, so let me make, I hope this, these are not controversial statements. I would argue that data analytics is statistics. That's what I, I would say. I think there's a little bit of rebranding going on. Maybe we can talk about kind of that idea of business data analytics, uh, a lot of focus on communication to drive decision making. But the fundamental definition of statistics around pooling and describing inference and deduction for the purpose of supporting decision making, it's already there. And so for me, I subscribe to that idea. Now I'm going to go one step further. Like, and, and John, thank you very much for mentioning James and all. Literally my favorite book. You can get that free online, download it free online from Springer. The, it is an introduction to statistical learning. And you'll notice that, that they didn't say machine learning. And I do support that idea of using the term statistical learning. Because every time I do machine learning, I think statistically. And what's really good about that, I think that drives some robustness. For instance, if you switch to a non-parametric model, uh, John mentioned decision trees before. We recognize that non-parametric models truly are parameter rich. And we recognize from just basic concepts of degrees of freedom, you'll need more data to fit those models. And so I, I really do appreciate that about statistics. It drives us to think, I think, in a more robust manner. And I really do see it as an extension. Interesting. Interesting. Well, John, I have a question for you. And this one actually comes from the audience. Um, what about SQL? How, how important is SQL to know and to practice in the context of data science for you particularly? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, we 
you have to distinguish between data engineering and data science here, or, you know, I kind of view the data science role as, is, is kind of separate from a data engineer's role. A data engineer's role would be heavily SQL based, right? You're going to be basically building database schemas and, you know, build, you know, building out tables and whatever, basically getting all the data model ready for the data scientist to come in and basically just pull from the, pull from the data that's already been engineered and, and start to build models and stuff. Um, I think it's good for, for every data scientist probably needs to know a little bit of SQL. Um, you know, I, I, I found that for the most part, if the data engineering has been done well for me and, and the things are in the, in the SQL database well, then it's usually just one SQL call to extract the data I need. And then I do the rest of the manipulation on the, on the say pandas side. So, you know, pandas as a function read SQL and you can basically just put your SQL string right in there, read from the database. And then you have everything in a pandas data frame and you can, you, you can do all the manipulation on, on that side. Um, you know, so I think just basic queries for, for a data scientist, just basic queries, select statements, understanding those kind of things uh, are useful. Um, and then obviously if you go into the data engineering side, you need, you need a lot more than just sure. that. No, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, Michael, question for you. So you, I think just to, and, and please fact check me if I'm wrong. You said some of the most important things to being an energy data scientist are domain expertise, a good understanding of, of statistics. And number three is enough coding skills to be dangerous just to get, you know, you where you need to go, but not any more than that. Are there any other skills that will set you apart as a data scientist that you can think of? Wow, wow. I, I, I feel like I'm, um, I'm being interviewed. You know, I, just, just thinking about that, what would really matter? Well, I used to be a team leader back in industry and I used to interview people. And now I work with uh, 13 PhD students that I'm trying to mentor and help work with them. And um, boy, you know, the old uh, good communication skills, being able to communicate your ideas. I love, you know, what's fascinating to me is if you can bridge, if you can integrate from this new, these new emerging technologies in the data-driven space to communicate in a way that's um, understandable. Mm -hmm. to pract general practitioners, to management, and to be able to impact decisions. I think that's huge, huge. And I, I think one thing we've got to be very careful of in this space is that tendency to fall into that rut to start baffling everybody around us. So I, I, I do think that if you're able to be a bridge to integrate, to understand and communicate, I think that's important. I think that's an important skill. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And I think we've seen that too within some of our classes, being able to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it is almost just as important as, you know, being able to be an effective practitioner, right? Because if you can't defend your results, if you can't explain your reasoning, if you can't show someone else how to reproduce your results, then it's really all for nothing, right? I mean, no one's going to have confidence in it and use it for decision-making and other people aren't going to be able to pick it up. The ultimate thing you can do in an energy company is develop new tools and methodologies which, which get widely used by your peers. That's, I'll tell you what, that's a great year. That's a year you're looking forward to the uh, review with your boss. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Michael and John, this question's for both of you. Um, so you guys are obviously amazing practitioners, right? Michael, you spent a number of years in industry doing a lot of this stuff, right? acting as a team leader, et cetera. John, you spent a number of years at Sandia implementing a lot of this code um, into your workflows as well. How did you guys get so good at communicating and teaching others how to do it? Like, how did you learn to be able to distill down these principles into a way that folks like me, you know, a non-data scientist, just a finance guy can really understand? Do you have any tips on, you know, communicating practices? How do you explain this stuff to lay people? Because um, I think that's an important skill just to kind of riff off the last question as well. John, why don't we start with you? Yeah, that's a, Richard Feynman answered this a long time ago, right? It, you have to be able to teach it to someone else. Right? So if you really want to understand something, try to teach it to someone else. 
and and then then you'll you'll quickly under you know uh, it, it will be revealed your your own understanding of, of the material, right? Um, and so I think yeah, having the opportunity to mentor others, teach others, uh, it really helps deepen your own understanding of these kind of things. And yeah, I think certainly these are just things that you have to to do. Um, I, I do I want to let Michael answer this as well, but I, then I do have. I have another answer to your previous question about what are the uh, other skills. So I agree with Michael's skills about communication and other things, but I have a few more things to say about that. So, but anyway, let's, let's let Michael answer. Uh, you know. John, I'm just yeah. going to parrot what you said, yeah. and yeah. I'm just going to say thank you to the Longhorns yeah. because I'll tell you what undergrads becoming a professor and standing in a lecture hall in front of, you know, 70, 80 undergrads, you're going to, it's going to become very apparent immediately, any holes that you have in your understanding. And you'll know immediately with feedback, if you're explaining in a way that cannot be understood and they will drive you to it, they will challenge yeah. you. And so I'm just saying, thank you to the undergrads. You're helping us yeah. learn how to teach. That's awesome. So just to, just to kind of um, summarize what you guys said, practice and iteration of just actually teaching others a lot of these concepts will enable you to be a better communicator in the long run you just have to go through the number of reps is that do you guys agree with that i mean just simply 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 put i would give you an a for that summary perfect that's high praise um <laughs> so john yeah i'd love to, i'd love to hear your kind of response to what other skills are important for an energy data scientist sure so I, I definitely agree with Michael and with respect to communication. The other thing I would say is that picking up, you know, what would be tr traditionally considered DevOps or software engineering skills. And at the top of that list is, is Git and GitHub. So Git, the version control system and Git Hub, the collaborative environment built around that, right? Um, it, it, you can learn so much when you're com comfortable in that environment, uh, uh, you know, by, you can learn uh, by contributing to open source software. I mean, most of it's been developed on GitHub. You, you can, you know, communicate with others through issues, pull requests. You learn how to navigate that system. You can also get, you know, the latest and greatest bug fixes and other things, you know, before they're also pulled into to the master. Uh, but m more importantly, and then if you take that a step further in, in DevOps and you think about like continuous integration, unit testing, and all of those things, um, it can actually make you a more productive data scientist in your day-to-day -day analysis as well, because you're going to spend if you if you implement those practices, version control, continuous integration, uh, those things. You're going to spend less time developing code, or specifically, you're going to spend less time debugging, because all, all of that sort of automated procedure, uh, dev development operations in place are going to you know basically force a, force a certain quality onto your code uh, that will enable you to debug faster and do things like that. So in the end, you'll be a more productive data science for implementing all of those. And then, like Michael said, I mean, what's more rewarding than having other people use, use your tools? And the way we share tools today is on GitHub, you know, software tools. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, to, to have nice, clean repositories that other people can go in and use and collaborate with. Uh, and I think everybody wins when, when code is shared and well-written code is shared. And, and collaborated on in, in that kind of ecosystem like that. So that that's another uh, skill that is, is you know not a, a pure data science skill, but 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 really is useful for data scientists to know. Awesome. No, that's a that's a that's a great point. Um, I know you you stress the importance of Git and GitHub during our classes, and I know it's often frustrating when you're first learning it, but once you get the hang of it you know, you can really fly through and do a lot, um, especially within that terminal window. So that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, wanted to um, change it up a little bit. So you guys have a variety of interests. You have a, a variety of PhD students. You work with a lot of different topics. How do you guys find data sets and projects to work on? Like, how, what does that process look like when you're looking to apply machine learning or data science to a uh, a problem that you're trying to solve, um, you know, within academia. I'm just curious, like, how does that idea generation phase come up, um, and how do you go about vetting and prototyping ideas, etc.? Michael, why don't you start? Okay. Um, so I sent out a tweet about two months ago, I think. Um, one of my uh, junior PhD students came to my office frustrated, 
and they just sat down. Um, this is actually, this is funny in my office, it was a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and it was basically, I, I'm, how do I come up with new ideas? How do I do research? How do I be a PhD student? And was really interesting. I tried to kind of fumble around, give them some advice, but then I went home that night and I just started writing down a list and thinking about how you come up with new ideas. So I, I've sent that out and shared that, but I'll tell you at the top of the list is practice. When you're actually applying and you're actually solving real world problems, you'll tend to see the gaps. You'll see the holes. Now, at the same time, there are so many opportunities and energy, and, and I really do appreciate um, John making references to some new like books from Google and other technologies that are coming out right now. When you look at all of the great technology, it's hard to keep up in this area. And somebody's just asked a question, Gregory, around reinforcement learning. You know, everything that comes out, you can ask yourself, how can we use that in our problems? to solve our problems. And so there's many great opportunities like that, just transferring technologies because the devil's always in the details. It's not just run. Our context is unique. Our spatial context is unique. We often have to do other developments to make it work in our field. So, you know, those are two really great avenues for coming up with ideas. I think, uh, Michael, he was specifically asked one question. One part of that was specifically about data sets. And you forgot to mention that as a geostatistics guy, you just make them up. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say that. And I hope I hope that's OK to say. But as a geostatistician, it's pretty I can make up really good fake data. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and let me just defend that a little bit. We can test those models against geologic data sets, against the statistics we know from real like um, outcrop analogs and so forth. And we can then use, we are driven to do that, to use them as training models. But John, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I tease you about it, but it's, it's absolutely, you know, for model val validation, it's, it's important to have an understanding of the, of the data set, right? And so if you start with synthetic data, Make sure everything's working first, and then you can move on to more complicated things with lots of noise and whatever. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, I think everybody's uh, along the data set lines. Everybody has a lot of interest in the Evolve data set that Ecuador released a, a few years ago. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'd love it. You know, I'd say in academia, a lot of the data sets that we get access to come from our collaborations with companies. And unfortunately we can't share those widely often. They're, they're limited to just the use of our graduate students. And if we do publish them in any way, we often have to anonymize them to the point that they are not useful to other people outside just reading the paper. Um, so it'd be great for more companies to kind of jump on the, the open data initiative. And, and you know, I mean, there, there was, there'd be no way uh, we'd be where we are in, in Image, image recognition if it wasn't for the image net, right? I mean, and all the labeled images. So I, I think for us to make real progress in using, applying machine learning techniques in the oil and gas industry, we're gonna need more data that's that's of high quality and, and open access. So it's a call to arms to- Call to arms. <laughs> so everyone, one, go back to your companies and ask to open source some of your data yeah. if you can. Yeah. Uh, that's our plea. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, do you ever think Excel as a tool will ever get phased out? Do you think, do you think the future is truly code-based or BI tools-based, or do you see an opportunity for each tool to kind of coexist um, together? How, how do you think about that just holistically overall? Michael, we'll start with you. I feel like I need to disclose a conflict of interest here. At one point, Microsoft saw some of my work in Excel and sent me some swag, including a t-shirt that says, I Excel with Excel green. So just full disclosure there. Um, so this is my attitude. I, I always like to meet people where they are. And I've taught data analytics courses from Excel because they weren't ready to work in Python and with all the libraries and so forth. I don't think that's optimum. Um, this is how I would say, this is what I would say about Excel. It's a great spreadsheet. It, it does a great job at what it was designed to do. And I think people pushed it further. I've seen many people try to develop entire workflows in Excel and then deploy it by basically copy and paste into emails. 
or sharing on a server, which, you know, I, I think Dr. Foster would not agree with that approach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, my issue is not, I mean, I think Excel in and of itself is a decent piece of technology. Um, my, my, it goes back to the software engineering aspects. I mean, first of all, if you can learn Excel, you can learn Python. Uh, and, and the second thing is, you know, the, there's, there's not the software engineering infrastructure behind Excel. Like how do you write unit tests for Excel? I mean, I, there probably is a way, uh, maybe, I, I, but it's just not common practice. It's not something that, that people regularly do. However, you know, I can, I can think of three unit test frameworks for Python right now. You know, and there's probably far more than that, right? Um, and same thing, you know, Excel, Excel spreadsheets are not really amenable to version control, right? So I mentioned earlier Git and GitHub being important. And Michael Hardy, uh, who was one of the attendees from one of our earliest uh, datum, datum workshops, he piped in there and he, and he said that, uh, and I like his point, he said, I think Git should fall in the umbrella of learning to code. It shouldn't be something extra. Uh, and, I, and I agree with him. So thanks for that comment, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the benefit of Python over Excel in that case is, you know, from a software engineering standpoint, that you're going to be able to write far more robust code that will be far more extensible to the community, shareable, you know, uh, and, and of, of higher quality in the long run and scale, right? I mean, you know, we teach a course Python for Excel addicts and basically we're taking in that course, we're taking common workflows and and Excel and showing you how to convert them to Python, but then, but then showing where you could take it from there. Like for example, you know, you, how you can take in easily with virtually the same code that you would use to create a type curve for one set of data, you can create it for 10,000, you know, in the, in the same, in the same sort of, uh, you know, virtually the same code. And, and it's much harder to do that kind of thing in, in Excel. Sure, no, that, that, that's very helpful. Okay, so we're kind of getting close to it on time. So I thought I'd kind of ask a kind of open-ended question that you guys can take however, in whichever direction you'd like. Um, what have we missed or haven't talked about in terms of folks interested in becoming a data scientist? Anything that any other kind of impart like final pieces of wisdom that you would give somebody interested in becoming a citizen data scientist, an energy data scientist, um, who is starting from kind of square one right now. Any thoughts on, on that kind of journey and starting that journey? Michael, why don't we start with you? So let me just reiterate, we subsurface engineers, geoscience scientists are well prepared. We've been big data for decades. We're used to working with uncertainty. We're used to trying to build data-driven models because we had to. We, we did not, I really do appreciate the fact that Dr. Foster was talking about his transition and moving to more kind of geo materials. We know they're heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. We know they're sparsely sampled. One trillionth of the subsurface typically is sampled volumetrically one trillionth. That's what we have available to us in direct measures. And so we already have been thinking about so many of these things, um, geostatistics, is spatial data analytics. Statistics is data analytics. And we've already been building lots of proxy models. Anybody who's been involved in reservoir modeling has already been doing design of experiments to explore uncertainties. They've been running flow forecasting, and then they've been going ahead and trying to fit some form of surrogate model, some proxy model. So it's very interesting. Many of these skills are already there with us. And I think it's not an accident that many of the geostatisticians, people who do reservoir modeling, learn on the job and they learned well. They did great. And it's not an accident that many of the emerging centers for data analytics and machine learning are those centers that were previously geostatistics. You know, I, we just saw one of the people here in the, in the chat window, uh, one of Clayton Deutsch's former students, my PhD advisor, they're doing machine learning. Jeff Kares is doing machine learning at Stanford. And so I think it's natural for us in our field to have a leadership position in this technology. Sure, no, that, that's, a, that's a great answer. Um, John, anything you, you'd add, any final pieces of wisdom on becoming an energy data scientist? Uh, I think I'll just echo again what Michael said, but maybe differently. I think, you know, again, engineers who, are, who can code, 
are well prepared, right? Uh, you, you have a strong mathematics background, um, and and you can code well. You're you're well prepared, and then it's just a matter of practice and learning the lingo. And of course, our courses are great at, at those. I mean, we, we cover the things you would need in there, um, as well as like the references I mentioned, the Python Data Science Handbook by Jake from Enterplas and uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning by uh, James and others. So um, those two books are, are great books. We recommend them in the course, courses we teach and other things. So, and free, of course. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we, we come from the, the, the right background. We're well prepared. So then it's just a matter of practice. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I think that's a, that's a good place to close. Um, just wanted to thank both of you, Dr. Foster and Dr. Perch, for, for doing this panel discussion. I thought it was really insightful hearing about your backgrounds and your kind of thoughts on the industry and the space. Um, thank you to everyone who took the time out of their afternoon to come join us as well. We'd love to hear any feedback and thoughts and questions you have. Our plan is to do more of these in the future. So if you have good topics that you'd like to see covered and us chat through, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you in one of our classes or one of our webinars in the future. So thank you everyone for the time and um, we shall see you all soon. Thank you. Take care everybody.